It's been a long time since we've heard any new originals from Bob Dylan. 2012 Tempest was the last time, and many people thought that might be Bob's last album, especially since the name Tempest. Tempest is the name of Shakespeare's final play, and I feel this speculation only intensified when he followed Tempest with a trilogy of cover albums, covering the works of Frank Sinatra and the Great American Songbook. It had seemed that in the 2010s that Dylan was a creatively spent force. Instead, he just wanted to while away his time playing the songs of his youth with sparse, spacious arrangements and his gravelly aged voice. So then it was quite a surprise when he dropped Murder Most Foul, a 17 minute long single, which bizarrely enough became Dylan's first ever number one in the US charts. So here we sit in 2020, a calamitous start to the decade, uncertainty filling every passing day, and Bob Dylan's dropped a new album, Rough and Rowdy Ways, 58 years after his debut record. The first thing when thinking about reviewing an album is to really get a feel of it, get a grip on what kind of story you want to tell with your review. Some albums, you want to analyse them by the themes they convey in their lyrics. Others, the artist's change in musical styles. Some, perhaps, the biographic facts which led to the album's creation. But Rough and Rowdy Ways is an album which kind of defies such systematic attempts to capture and concretise it. It's like a rainbow. You get to the end of it, only to find that it's disappeared, yet again beyond your grasp. Dylan traps you in an endless search for meaning, an irresistible, insurmountable journey that you just can't help but take. So I guess we've got to approach this album in some ways like you may a novel. We'll start with the first chapter, I Contain Multitudes. Sonically, I Contain Multitudes appears to be a continuation of the airy, melancholic tones of Shadows in the Night or Triplicate. It's a simple arrangement, the guitars fluttering like leaves on an autumn day, the steel guitar glistening, and Dylan's voice like a sip of whiskey warming the very fabric of your being. The music stays tame and subservient to the vocals, until Dylan finally allows it permission to rise, letting the instruments come together, breaking down their spatial separation. It's a gorgeously arranged song, and the same could be said for the entire record. But as with much of Dylan's works, it's the lyrics in I Contain Multitudes which provide the bulk of the intrigue. Initially, it seems very personal. Lyrics like, half my soul, baby, belongs to you, or I paint landscapes, I paint nudes. It seems peculiarly straightforward, until one line really, really throws you. He says, I'm just like Anne Frank, like Indiana Jones, and them bad boys, the Rolling Stones. Suddenly you catch yourself thinking you're, you're like Anne Frank, right, okay, well, the Rolling Stones? Maybe it's plausible, both musicians. Indiana Jones? Well, I don't know. It stopped me in my tracks. Such blatant references to pop culture and history. What could the link possibly be? I felt like Alan Turing trying to crack the Enigma code. I found myself desperately searching to unravel the mystery, to see and find the secret messages that Dylan had hidden in the song. My mind raced. Well, and Frank, she was killed by Nazis. Indiana Jones, that that movie it has Nazis in it, but but then the, the Rolling Stones. Well, I hope they don't have anything to do with Nazism. But then it came to me. <laughs> I was taking the wrong approach. There is no secret message with this triad of unusual figures. There is no hidden meaning. To understand I contain multitudes is not as hard as it seems to be. You just have to understand the central refrain, I contain multitudes. And for this, we need to go to the American poet, Walt Whitman, from where Dylan draws this line. In section 51 of his work, Song of Myself, there's this famous verse. Do I contradict myself? Very well, then I contradict myself. I am large, I contain multitudes. 
Whitman in this verse is expressing his view that the self is ever-changing. It's not a fixed entity with a constant identity. It's something which inherently contains multitudes. It inherently contains contradictions. Tomorrow's thoughts might contradict today's. But that's okay. You can still sing the songs of experience like William Blake, but also drive fast cars and eat fast food. Just because William Blake's poetry is considered high art, something you might want to contemplate with thought and intent, and fast food and fast cars, well, they're just commonplace, consumerist, quick fixes. That, that, that's okay. You can have both of those as part of your personality. Anne Frank, Indiana Jones, the Rolling Stones, this absurd triad of people that Dylan's referencing, that's, that's the point, the very absurdity of it, because they contain, individually, multitudes. And Dylan contains multitudes in bringing such contradictions together. The man who sleeps with life and death in the same bed, as the song later says. There's no great metaphor or vague inferences needed here. Dylan, like the rest of us, is a complex, nuanced, contradictory character fundamentally. For human nature is ever-changing for both Dylan and Walt Whitman. And that's okay because we all contain multitudes. But then False Prophet hits you with a gut punch. It's roaring blues lick, distorted and melodic, though not entirely unfamiliar. As many of us have noticed, it does bear a striking resemblance to the single If Lovin' Is Believin' by Billy the Kid Emerson, a song released on Sam Phillips's famous Sun label. And it does have the same melody. It, it is in the same key. Uh, it even has the same feel. I mean, sure, rhythmically, if you want to get into the nitty-gritty music theory, Dylan does indeed mix it up a bit, give it that Dylan-esque feel. But especially since Dylan has played Billy the Kid Emerson on his Theme Time Radio Hour show, which is a fantastic radio show, by the way. But it's for you to decide whether this plagiarism is too much for you. Dylan may argue that he's simply participating in the wider folk tradition of borrowing and taking ideas, mixing them up and turning them into something different. And it certainly can't be denied, regardless of whether you think Dylan should have credited Billy the Kid Emerson or not, that he does turn this song into something different. It's a song that's impossible to not see in autobiographical terms. It's centered around the notion of a false prophet, someone who's masquerading as a holy prophet, but is in fact a layperson. Dylan seems to be calling people out for seeing him as a prophet, but he, though, he takes it for granted that people are seeing him as a, a false prophet, likely in view of his Christian beliefs. But regardless, he sings, I ain't no false prophet. I just know what I know. I go where only the lonely can go. There's an acceptance here that he has a gift in songwriting, but it makes it seem as if that gift isn't in the conscious action of writing a song. It isn't in the intentionality he puts into the lyrics, but it is, as he says in a New York Times interview, that the songs seem to know themselves and that they know that I can sing them. The songs work through him. He's simply a vessel. The bluesy rhythms in the song are like a slowed down version of any number of blues inspired tunes from Blonde on Blonde, like Leopard Skin Pillbox Hat. If you sped the song up, it would bear a resemblance. I wouldn't say it quite fit in with Blonde on Blonde, Those, these albums are rather far apart, but it certainly does bear a similarity, that driving nature to it, reminiscent of Dylan's live shows from the 60s with the Hawks, later the band. But still, it's hard to not go back to the plagiarism to conclude on this song. It is so obvious. But maybe that is just part of the song. Maybe it's just an intentional part of the song. I mean, after all, he's not trying to be a false prophet. He just says what he says. He does what he does. And if it's somebody else's melody, so be it. In his words, he's just here to bring vengeance on somebody's head. But things shift after the rowdier ways of False Prophet to My Own Version of You, a swing jazz-derived song with a lightly brushed percussive beat, leading it through Dylan's dark and macabre lyrics. Lyrics where he's combining the physical attributes of Marlon Brando from The Godfather and Al Pacino from Scarface with a tank to get a robot commando. You've then got the image 
of the of a rawhide lash ripping the skin from Sigmund Freud and Karl Marx's backs in hell. Dylan sings about taking different parts of the body, different parts of the mind, of the personality, of people's being, and combining them in some, like Dr. Frankenstein, to bring someone to life. His own version of you, or perhaps himself, or perhaps the world. By combining all these elements into a, a seemingly perfect being, he hopes for answers. He asks questions such as, is there a light at the end of the tunnel? or what it means to be or not to be. These metaphysical claims beat at the heart of such a startlingly vivid song, which departs from the more traditional storytelling which you've tended to get on Dylan's later albums. You look at Pain, Blood or Scarlet Town from Tempest, but here he's violent and strange. He's surreal and amused, all to the sound of a looping, rarely changing melody. If you hadn't guessed so far, this album is a terrific achievement. It's richer, deeper, more nuanced and personal in its scope than previous efforts, and it's executed almost flawlessly. Musically, it's a treat to the ears, and Dylan's voice certainly hasn't sounded this good since perhaps Oh Mercy in the 80s. And I've made up my mind to give myself to you is a particularly great example of how the songs in his recent Sinatra phase have really been building up to this moment. Rough and rowdy ways feels like a culmination of the past decade of work. I've made up my mind feels like an old swing song with the slightly cheesy refrain, I've made up my mind to give myself to you as backing singers harmonize behind Dylan's voice. But like those old songs of Sinatra and the great American songbook he's drawing inspiration from, this song is full of wisdom and depth in its brief simplicity. The lyrics are far more than they appear to be on the surface, and Dylan succeeds in capturing this perfectly. It's far more straightforward than, say, my version of You with its dark, macabre lyrics, but I've made up my mind is hauntingly beautiful, enchantingly melancholic. He manages to tap straight into your heart as his voice cascades upon you like a gentle waterfall. Mortality is a theme which has characterised much of Dylan's work since Time Out of Mind in the 90s, whether it be his own or everyone else's. When asked recently in a New York Times interview about whether he considers his own mortality, he replied that he thinks more about the death of the human race, that every individual's life is transient, it, it matters less than the perpetuation of the human race itself. This general concept is what matters a lot to Dylan. Perhaps Black Rider is the most obvious expression of these feelings on the record. It's a song which many would argue frames Dylan in conversation with death, with his own personal mortality, but I feel it's got a more generally apocalyptic tone to it. It doesn't concern Dylan's own death so much as it does the apocalypse, the death of humanity. Each note ominously rings out before falling into silence and then resuming again with another chord. And this song also has a few really amusing lyrics. Uh, one of my favorites has to be the size of your cock will get you nowhere. I mean, that's just brilliant coming from a Nobel Prize winner. At the moment, this review seems a bit like a track by track review, but I don't want to break down every single song for you, since part of the joy of this album and of Dylan's discography is immersing yourself cold within the images and pictures he paints, linking it to your own understanding, own life experiences. For Dylan, they, they simply are what they are. He recently stated that the lyrics on this album are a real thing, they're tangible, they're not metaphors. But still, I can't help but at least briefly mention some of the songs that I don't want to talk about in detail. Goodbye Jimmy Reed is a swinging blues song with a real rhythmic kick and high energy to it, while Mother of Muses calls back to Shadows in the Night. It's a delicate, tender, heartfelt track with references to Elvis and Martin Luther King and how Dylan could sit and tell their stories all day. I Cross the Rubicon is certainly a highlight, with a restless, Muddy Waters-esque blues to it, getting louder at parts as Dylan violently sings that his bones are trembling with rage and he'll make your wife a widow. 
It's a series of fateful actions and consequences linked by death, by mortality, and the certainty of action that comes with the proverbial crossing of the Rubicon. Well, one could see it as literally about Julius Caesar crossing the Rubicon, initiating his path to become the dictator of the Roman Empire. I think Dylan is using it in its more commonplace meaning. To cross the Rubicon means to irrecoverably commit to a course of action. And in this case, it's action that's violent, it's action that's vengeful, and it's a wonderfully gripping framing for an otherwise old school blues song as Dylan brings to life every single word. Still, I did hint earlier that this album isn't quite perfect, and Key West brackets Philosopher Pirate is the only song that really doesn't resonate with me on the album. It's one that I also do kind of wish that I could talk more about though. It's full of interesting references, from Harry S. Truman to Muddy Waters to Jack Kerouac, and of course, most crucially, to Key West in Florida. Now look, I've never been to Florida before, and I've honestly never even heard of Key West before. So admittedly, this is a song which I do find rather challenging to even get a grip on. I saw one review describe this song as like a Florida travel brochure, and yeah, I, I do kind of concur, and it is a bit of a weaker point on the album as a result. I just don't find the lyrics substantive enough to really survive for the near 10 minute runtime of the song. Maybe that's just because I can't relate to it. Maybe I don't find Key West and Florida to be this idyllic dreamlike place that Dylan makes it out to be. But at least I do find myself bemused and I guess captivated when in the fourth verse the narrator suddenly marries a prostitute at the age of 12, which really just comes out of nowhere. Um, but other than that, it's a relatively meandering song with, I feel, a far less interesting story and far more mundane concepts than the rest of the album. And this leaves us with the centrepiece of the album, the song which this album will always be remembered for, Murder Most Foul the 17 minute epic centered around the assassination of John F. Kennedy in 1963. I'm sure most watching will probably have an opinion on this song by now. Nick Cave wrote a lovely analysis of it and it's been talked to death since it came out. But I would like to present my own interpretation to cap off this video and review or analysis of Rough and Rowdy Ways. Dylan starts by transporting us back to 1963, where thousands were watching in Dallas, Texas, but no one really saw a thing when Kennedy was shot. It was like the greatest magic trick ever under the sun, perfectly executed and skillfully done. Kennedy's death certainly cast a large shadow on the progressive-minded people of the Greenwich folk scene like Dylan. His contemporary and wonderful protest singer, Phil Oakes, was reportedly inconsolable upon hearing that Kennedy had died. It seemed like the end of a really hopeful new age. But then Dylan explores that new age. He starts with referencing the Beatles, I Wanna Hold Your Hand, through to Woodstock as a high, Altamont as a low, before reaching Tommy by The Who and heading back to the main event. That they mutilated JFK's body, they tore out his brain, rubber dub dub, for that innocence which was shattered as Johnson was sworn in at 238 and the soul of a nation was torn away. In those times, what can you really do? You need something firm to grasp on. You need something consistent, something solid, something that can tie you to a world which feels unbelievable. And we're certainly living through a world where that message resonates. The times they are a changing at the moment, and it's easy to get lost in what's going on in the world, whether that be through inequality or virus and illness. So then Dylan grasps onto meaning. He asks DJ Wolfman Jack to play Etta James and John Lee Hooker, to play the Eagles and Felonious Monk. And these songs are linked to the event, to JFK's assassination in Dylan's mind, though some predate it, like John Lee Hooker, some post-date it, like the reference to another one bites to dust. Because even when all hope seemed to be lost and Kennedy was shot, in Nick Cave's words, 
Dylan's relentless cascade of song references points to our potential as human beings to create beautiful things, even in the face of our own capacity for malevolence. Surrounded by a formless instrumentation with playful, daring piano and subtle strings, there's an eternal, timeless quality to it. To conclude, Dylan transcends beyond everything he should have been capable of doing at this age, delivering a timely yet timeless expression of deep beauty and humanity, more listenable sonically and aesthetically perhaps than the gravelly voice of Tempest. Every song feels so cohesive, beautifully crafted and put together, and his voice is the centrepiece of that, and indeed this is an album that could only have been sung by Dylan. It's more personal than Dylan usually allows, but still with that cautious detachment so that we can't delve too closely into his mind. It's brilliant, and Dylan demonstrates himself still as one of the great living songwriters and lyricists. It's full of depth and profundity that won't be known for years, years, and I can't wait for many, many more listens to uncover the different meanings. It's an album that's human or too human. And it reminds me of the image of the wanderer in Nietzsche's book of the same name, Human or Too Human. And this image came into my mind upon listening to it, and I think it sums up some of my thoughts on Dylan in this era quite nicely. So I'll leave you with a quote. He who has come only in part to a freedom of reason cannot feel on earth otherwise than as a wanderer. Though not as a traveller towards a final goal, for this does not exist, but he does want to observe and keep his eyes open for everything that actually occurs in the world, therefore he must not attach his heart too firmly to any individual thing. There must be something wandering within him, which takes its joy in change and transitoriness. This has been the album, man. Thank you so much for watching my review of Rough and Rowdy Ways. Please check out this album. It is fantastic, certainly a highlight of the year, and I'm sure will end up being a highlight of the decade if we all manage to make it that far in. This has been the Album Man. Thanks for watching, and long live rock and roll.